I watched this film uh, the other night called Nefarious, which is based on a novel by Steve Deese, who has a show over with our friends at the, at the Blaze. And, um, and a lot of people kept bothering me to, to watch it, and I hesitated. First of all, it's, it's kind of a, it's not really horror. It's kind of a spooky movie. It's not, it's not really horror. Um, and I, I don't enjoy a lot of horror. Um, and I also, I like to promote good stuff, but I'm, I was worried that this wasn't any good. So I actually really liked it. Now, I've talked to some uh, conservatives who didn't like it as much. Uh, and the, one of the uh, objections they had was uh, they said that, that there was some preaching in it. And there's a 30-second scene in it that could have been cut out. It was a little right-wing preachy. Uh, and, and the other objection they had that, that there's an atheist in it. And they said the atheist, it wasn't a fair, they should have made the atheist a stronger uh, character so he could make his case better. But, but, okay, so those are the objections. But I have to say, I, I couldn't stop watching it. Uh, I was totally interested in it. I wasn't messing around doing other stuff. Uh, I thought it was really creative the way it used its budget. I'm a big advocate, and I have a hard time getting people to listen to me on this, that if you want to make a small budget film, you got to write the film into the budget. you got to write a small budget film. You cannot make a film that looks bad uh, because you couldn't afford the scenes and the effects that you needed to make it. You write the film into but So this movie is almost, the, almost the entire movie is two people in a room talking. Uh, and, and what it is, is it's the, the, uh, a story about a guy who's got to do a court-ordered, a psychiatrist got to do a court-ordered examination of a man condemned to die that day and say that he's not insane so he can be cleared to be executed. And he walks in, uh, the psychiatrist is played by Jordan Belfry, uh, who also looks like Michael Knowles, and, uh, and and he's from Entourage. And the condemned man is played really well, really good performance by Sean Patrick Flannery uh, of the Boondock Saints. And the condemned man says, I'm glad you're here. I invited you here because I'm actually not who I seem to be. I'm actually a demon. I'm actually a person possessed by a demon. Here's the trailer, cut six. Execution scheduled for 11 p.m. But he's trying to convince us he's gone insane. And therefore incapable of being executed. I need you to prove he's faking it. Edward? I'm gonna ask you some questions. I'm not Edward. I'm a demon. Demons aren't really a thing. What happened to Edward? We own him. We? <laughs> He's a master manipulator. You have your head so twisted around you think you're the killer. Not him. And give me something to make me believe you. Prove to me you're a demon. Probably just a coincidence. <laughs> the light goes out. He says, it's probably just a coincidence. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed the conversation. It was spooky. Uh, and it's not just a conversation. It has a drama going on behind it. It had some a really good, um, had a really good twist to it that I don't want to give away. Really good twist on the meaning of what the, because the demon is always saying things that are true, but don't mean what they seem, seem to mean. I really enjoyed that. I really liked the depiction of the, uh, struggle between good and evil. And you can tell the movie must have something to it because on Rotten Tomatoes, it got 33% from the critics and 97% from the humans. And so you can tell that the people liked it. And usually when anything is in favor of God, it gets 0%. So they couldn't quite give it 0%. So they gave it 33%. So it's obviously a pretty gripping. I thought it was gripping. And so when I was uh, when I was thinking about it, I, I, I recommend that. I think it's 90 minutes well spent if you enjoy these kind of things. So, but the thing that I was thinking about is I enjoy this so much more than I enjoy most Christian films. This is by the guy guys I think who made uh, God is, De is Not Dead. But I like this so much more than I like most Christian films. And I thought, why is that? And I think it's because it preaches Christian reality about the spiritual fight we're in, the fight between uh, demons and, and God. Uh, but it deals with evil, and it doesn't make the, the the ordinary people or the Christian people look good. It makes society look like what society is like. It's corrupt. Uh, capital punishment is is cruel. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not just, but it's it's cruel. Uh, it isn't. The movie isn't cloying with goodness because the problem is our argument is not that Christians are good and atheists are bad. Our argument is that Christ is good and Satan is bad. And that is a true argument. But it take, that argument takes place, that argument between good and evil takes place in a corrupt world. All of us 
in a corrupt world. Every single one of us part of a corrupt world. And, and I was thinking by showing evil and being about evil, the film does not become cloying uh, and sugary sweet the way most Christian films do. And this kind of led me to think about something else that I've been thinking about a lot, the fact that evil makes for good storytelling and good often doesn't. You know, there's a, a philosopher, a religious mystic uh, named Simone, her name is spelled Weil, but I think it's pronounced Ve, Simone Ve, she's French. Uh, and she said, imaginary evil is romantic and buried. Real evil is gloomy, monotonous, barren, boring. Imaginary good is boring. Real good is always new, marvelous, intoxicating. Now, as somebody who has spent my life writing crime stories about evil with, with evil people in them, I asked myself, why should this be? Why should it be that evil is riveting and that good doesn't really come across in, in a story when you have a good person? He's almost always defending, uh, he's almost, his, his goodness consists of def, of attacking evil, of fighting evil. So if he's a cop, he's fighting bad guys, a doctor fighting disease, a fireman fighting fires, but he's not good in and of itself. Now, none of us is righteous, and that's part of the reason why, but also there's a, there are two realms. I think this is essentially the argument of Christianity. There's a, a realm of power, which is the realm of the flesh, and there's a realm of love, which is the realm of the spirit. And so modern theorists uh, who don't believe in God, they don't believe in the spirit, always end up arguing about power. This is like Michel Foucault, uh, the famous French philosopher, who said that everything is power. Herbert Marcuse, who is the, the communist philosopher who uh, powers a lot of this stuff about uh, gender and critical race theory, a lot of this comes from Marcuse's theories, uh, basically, that everything is about power. Because in the flesh world, the material world, there is nothing with power. If I kill you, you're dead. If I beat you, you're beaten. Uh, if I crucify you, you're finished, right? That's the world of, of the flesh and the world of power. And so power becomes very attractive, right? Uh, this is why feminists want to be men, because they start out saying, well, men are not treating us fairly, and they end up saying, well, men have all the power, so we want to have the power, because they're materialists. Why blacks become racist, because they start out saying, well, whites are not being fair, they're being racist, and they end up saying, well, we hate whiteness. They end up becoming racist because they think, well, the racists have the power. We want the power. And that's the only way that works. And Jesus is saying something different. He's saying, yes, there is a realm of power, but there's also a realm of love. And that's where your true life is and your eternal life is. So, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of arguments about this uh, thing about, uh, you know, women, wives should su submit to their husbands and husbands uh, should love their wives. And women say, well, you feminists say, well, you can't submit to your husband. When you see a good marriage, what you often, uh, almost always in my experience, my personal experience, which is limited, but you know what it, what it is, in good marriages, women respect their husbands and husbands lead, but husbands love their wives. And you suddenly realize, gee, you know, it's actually not, she's actually not being dominated and, and he's not, uh, you know, being a tyrant if the marriage is a loving marriage because the love transforms the power dynamic and they actually wind up being quite, uh, equal. So I write these murder stories, and one of the things I've struggled with my whole life is the minute you show a murder, you romanticize the, the murderer. You can't help it because the murder is cool, it's exciting, it's interesting, and the person who dies is gone, and so the murderer has all the power, and our flesh is immediately attracted to power. Right. That's why when you're when you step into pornography and you get outside the realm of love, whether it's pornography online or uh, Fifty Shades of Grey for women, uh, you start dealing with power. You start dealing with the sexuality, the sensuality of power. Uh, I've told this story before, but just briefly, when I was writing ghost stories in Hollywood, I was selling ghost stories, so they started to call me in uh, to pitch horror stories to me and see if I wanted to write them. Uh, and as you got down the line, these horror stories became less uh, about the good people and more about the evil. And I went into a pitch once and the guy said, we want you to write a story. We have an idea for a story. A woman is kidnapped and she's tortured. And I said, yeah. They said, that's the story. <laughs> I said, I'm not, I'm not writing that story, you know, because that's just that's just uh, torture porn. That's what they literally called it that in Hollywood. It's very hard to tell a story without making evil 
attractive. How do you do it? Well, I've seen it done brilliantly. I hope I've done it brilliantly from time to time. There's a wonderful book by one of my favorite modern mystery writers, Ruth Rendell. She wrote a book called Judgment in Stone. She tells you who gets killed and who does the murder on the, in the first sentence of the book. And then the rest of the book, you just watch people live. You watch people live as the murderer comes closer and closer, and you start to realize that ordinary life is beautiful. Family life is beautiful. The little love that people show each other is beautiful, and this evil is dull and stupid and plotting, and she actually creates uh, that wonderful uh, sensation where she doesn't um, glamorize the murder. She glamorizes the the quotidian, the daily love between these people in this family. David Mamet, his uh, great play, uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, if you watch it carefully, uh, an act of courageous virtue takes place in the background where all the corruption is happening in the foreground. The corruption makes the good story, but the goodness kind of shines through it. Depictions of evil work when you use them in the context of love. One of my favorite plays, I've given two standing ovations in my life, literally two standing ovations in the theater in my life. Uh, One of them was for the play Sweeney Todd, Stephen Sondheim's brilliant, brilliant musical about the, this is a legendary guy, the evil uh, barber, Sweeney Todd, who cuts the throats of people because his wife was destroyed Uh, He was raped by a powerful judge, and he was sent off to prison, and now he's come back for revenge, and he's killing people all uh, in the barbershop. He's cutting their throats, and he's dumping their bodies. And his landlady, Mrs. Lovett, realizes she's she's got a pie shop, and she's poor, so she can't get the meat, and she realizes she can take the bodies of these, these dead bodies and, uh, and put, bake them into pies, and she'll have enough meat uh, to sell the pies. And so she gets this idea, and she's Uh, sells it to Sweeney Todd, and they sing this hilarious song in which she talks about all the different people she can eat. Here's a cut from the movie version of this uh, with uh, uh, Helena Bonham Carter as Mrs. Lovett and Johnny Depp as Sweeney Todd. It's cut seven. Here we are. at the oven. What is that? It's priest. Have a little priest. Is it really good? Sir, it's too good, at least. Then again, they don't commit sins or the flesh. So it's pretty fresh. Awful lot of fat. Only where it's at. Haven't you got poet or something like that? Now you see the trouble with poet is how do you know it's deceased? Try the priest. It's a great song and the audience goes nuts and laughs out loud. It is a show-stopping song. So you're laughing at murder and cannibalism. And you think, well, how can that be moral? How can that be right? But it is because the entire uh, play is about how by following his uh, desire for revenge in a corrupt world, Sweeney destroys himself. That's what the play is about. That's the theme of the play. So you are watching dramatize the reason why Jesus Christ said, love your enemies. He's telling you to save yourself because the world is corrupt and it is delightful when that corruption uh, gets paid off, just like uh, Tucker Carlson watching an Antifa guy get beaten up. It's delightful, but he pulls back from that and we pull back from Sweeney Todd when we see the horror of what he's done to himself, what he has done to himself by following revenge. So we see both the world of this, the flesh in which we enjoy the revenge because it's fair, because society's corrupt and this guy has been hard done by, and we also see the horror and, and retreat into the world of the spirit where we say, no, no, I'm not going to cheer for this Antifa kid being beaten up or for these people having their throat cut. Evil uh, is funny when the actors go home at the end, when people are not really being killed, uh, when we remember that we were made to be close to the angels, but we are fallen and we are closer to demons now. That's funny. That's like a man in a tuxedo falling into a mud puddle. When you can dramatize the world of power so that it will illuminates the life of love when you can dramatize the uh, the flesh so that it illuminates the spirit, then you've told a great story. And that, I think, is why uh, conservative art doesn't look like conservative life. And that's why we shouldn't be afraid when people deal with evil, when they deal with sex, when they deal with the corrupt world, if it is underpinned by a sense of the spirit and a sense of the world of love. God, I love that guy. He's great. If you want more like that, like and subscribe. And don't forget to subscribe to The Andrew Clavin Show wherever you get your podcasts.